Good morning and welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Today is Wednesday, March 23rd. And this morning we are continuing um, our uh, discussion and receiving testimony on H728, an act relating to opioid overdose response uh, services. And the focus really of today is to um, get an idea of what are the barriers, um, if any, um, on access to MAT, especially as it relates to um, pre-authorization. Uh, pre and uh, our first witness, we're gonna hear from uh, three people, three uh, professionals, medical professionals who are um, working um, very closely in this, starting with Dr. Um, Plaster, followed by Dr. Conjure, and um, ending with um, uh, Jacqueline Bray, who is a nurse practitioner um, at uh, Safe Recovery. Um, thank you, Dr. Cluster, for taking the time. Well, okay. and absolutely, thank you. I guess by way of introduction, um, so I, I'm Nels Cluster, and I am the medical director at the Hub in Brattleboro, as well as at Serenity House, which is a residential treatment center in Wallingford. And then I work with a multi-provider, uh, Large Spoke, uh, Savita Health in, in Bennington. Uh, and I could, you know, thank you for the opportunity as well. Um, the reason why I reached out to uh, Dane Whitman was I was concerned about some sections of H728 as related to prior authorizations and buprenorphine formulation choices and uh, higher dosage limits and being concerned that those changes might be uh, unnecessary if, if not harmful. Um, I'm hoping that I can build on the uh, previous testimony from Drs. Uh, Laconis and Lord, and hopefully not repeating what they've already uh, talked about. Uh, but uh, Pharmacology 101 is where I, I wanted to start because of the mistaken idea that the absence of naloxone makes the mono product preferred uh, over the combination. Uh, actually, it's the, it's, it's the opposite because the effectiveness of both these products is the same from a clinical sense. You know, as far as the work they do around uh, treating opiate uh, withdrawal and cravings. And the naloxone is actually added in there to hinder misuse and the negative consequences that come from misuse. And uh, to help understand that, I want to introduce the concepts of uh, bioavailability and intrinsic activity and uh, receptor affinity. So I'm really hoping that you got the handout that I sent to uh, Julie last night because that will certainly help. Um, so, you know, of course, Suboxone is a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. And uh, bioavailability basically means how much the medication gets into your system to do the work it's supposed to do. Uh, now, when you take this medication appropriately, which is, you know, sublingually or under the tongue, then about 50% of the buprenorphine is bioavailable. It's there to do what it's supposed to do. And the rest of it is sort of metabolized and, and, and lost from having effect. Uh, when you take the medication sublingually, the naloxone is ne has negligible absorption and really is not present to do what naloxone tends to do. Uh, if, however, and this is a general rule of thumb, if you are to inject uh, this medication, then the buprenorphine is 100% bioavailable, as is the naloxone being 100% bioavailable. Um, now, in this um, second table, uh, there's an inverse relationship to how strongly these medications adhere to the opioid receptors and how much they activate or turn on the system. Uh, starting with you know, opio you know, opioids, these are what I would call full strength opioids, the ones that most of us are probably familiar with, uh, morphine, oxycodone, Percocet, Dilaudid, uh, heroin, fentanyl, methadone. And because of the strength of these, the activity they have at the receptor, there's no limit to what they can do for pain relief. Uh, but conversely, then there's also the risk of overdosing because one of the potential side effects, especially as doses get higher, is that opioids can suppress respiration. They can stop the brain's drive to, to breathe. Uh, the buprenorphine is uh, also a strong medication. It's very effective for treating opioid use disorder. Uh, it's also useful for treating pain as well up to a certain level. Uh, it has uh, what's called, it's what we consider maybe a 50% uh, opioid. 
it has uh, ceiling effects or limits to its effectiveness. So some people with opiate use disorder will require stronger medication than the buprenorphine, uh, but also it means that we don't have the uh, concern about overdosing. That is really quite rare with uh, buprenorphine. Uh, the naloxone component has no um, uh, strength uh, at the uh, opioid receptor. Uh, it's what we call an antagonist. And you could understand this to be a cousin of Narcan. Uh, it fits into the opioid receptor and it blocks any other opioids from having a chance to occupy the receptors. Uh, so as I'm explaining to, to my patients how kind of the effect of this, I, I use the image of the game of King of the Hill. And if you were to consider uh, the game of King of the Hill to occupy opioid receptors, uh, out of all three of these uh, classes of medications, the naloxone and the Narcan are always gonna win the game of King of the Hill. Uh, wins the game over buprenorphine or the other opioids. Uh, buprenorphine having a stronger receptor affinity is gonna win the game at King of the Hill against the other opioids, which is what makes it helpful for uh, treatment for opioid disorder is that you need no longer to get the reinforcing effects or get high from the other opioids. Um, now, in the case of the, the mono versus the combination product, uh, if you inject the combination product, as I've mentioned, uh, the naloxone is there to do its work. It's 100% bioavailable. It's going to win the game of King of the Hill. And what that means is that it's going to dislodge the buprenorphine or inhibit the buprenorphine from getting the receptors or also dislodge other opioids from the receptors. And what that does is going to cause a rapid and severe withdrawal because your receptor has been filled with opioids that have a stronger signaling effect, and all of a sudden you're getting no signaling effect whatsoever. Um, and that is why it is there to discourage misuse because if you inject it, you get this serious, we call precipitate withdrawal and a lesson to uh, take your medication appropriately. Whereas if you were to inject a mono product, as you can see, you go from a 50% bioavailability to 100% bioavailability, which in essence means you're getting double the effects uh, from the buprenorphine. And over time, this could actually lead to more severe opiate use disorder as your tolerance then increases from using more and more. Um, then, so from that individual level, then I wanted to comment on the public health aspect of this. Uh, National Survey on Drug Use, it's a federal study, uh, been around for a long time. And what we see from this is about a quarter of people misuse their buprenorphine. Uh, now, when we say misuse, that, uh, of course, includes injecting it, you know, taking it in a proper fashion, uh, but also includes uh, diversion as well. And we know that misuse of these medications is much more common early in treatments. The risks are higher then. And from experience, too, we know that uh, misuse is much higher with the mono product than it is with the combination product. Uh, another study then, uh, again, close to home, uh, discern. Uh, from the National Institutes of Drug Abuse. Uh, this was a study uh, across northern New England, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, looking at intravenous drug use and uh, hepatitis C virus. And the participants, 85% uh, of the participants in that study reported that they used buprenorphine to get high. So we know a couple of, uh, one that, uh, you know, overprescribing as well can contribute to diversion. Uh, selling your medication, because in essence, uh, what I don't need for myself, I sell to, to make some money. And uh, we know as well, as was mentioned on Monday, that diversion then can contribute to new cases of opioid use disorder, more people getting used to using these medications. And uh, that seems to be especially uh, more common with the younger people who have buprenorphine as their first opioid. Um, I think that kind of the concrete example to sort of bring this all together is to look at uh, pregnant women. We used to recommend a mono product for pregnant women. There was the thought that even though it's a negligible amount of naloxone, that we were concerned about having adverse effects on the fetus. Uh, over time, what has happened is it's been determined there is no adverse effect from naloxone, again, probably because of a negligible absorption by the sublingual route. And so now the uh, combination products recommended for pregnant women as well, which is a particularly vulnerable population. Um, and, and this is for a couple of reasons, both individual benefits as well as public health benefits. Uh, changing medications is just disruptive to go from the combo to the mono during pregnancy and then back onto the combo after pregnancy. 
uh, disruptive, and a lot of uh, women are uncomfortable with that. Uh, as I've mentioned, there's you know fetal safety. There's no harm to the fetus uh, with this, but also there's the aspect of maternal uh, safety. Uh, it's it's quite sad that there's a high level of coercion on uh, was was a high level of coercion on pregnant women who were prescribed the mono product, uh, coerced by their partners and by peers who recognized they had this more uh, you know highly valued uh, medication. And so oftentimes you, you just it had an adverse effect on, on their wellness. And, and public health benefits, of course, with the combination is less diverted, so less of those problems, and also lower healthcare costs as well, because you know, with the, the mono product and diversion, there's uh, increased uh, injection as well, because that's typically the main purpose of uh, uh, seeking the mono product. And with less injection, of course, we get less infections, less abscesses, less bacterial infections, less cases of hepatitis and uh, HIV. Also, you know, we, we've got a very, I mean, we lead the nation as far as availability of uh, the M MOUD, medications for opiate use disorder, uh, which is also, you know, known as MAT, medication assisted therapy. Um, only one site in the state has a waiting list and that's simply because of uh, workforce issues we're not having enough counselors. Uh, and concern too for these completely telehealth organizations lacking critical oversight. They're, they're not doing drug screens, they can't do medication counts, and they don't do the physical exams, which are really important for determining appropriate dosage. So, you know, feeling that that makes the in person hub and spokes definitely a preferred uh, treatment setting over those. And then to kind of tie up specifically out the prior authorization process. Uh, we have medical directors agree that some sort of oversight is necessary, and that is a role played by prior authorizations. The, the vast majority of uh, these medications do not require a prior authorization. 85% uh, of doses are on 60 milligrams or less. Uh, having medications over 24 milligrams are ineffective. You're getting more medic. If you take more than 24 milligrams, you're taking more medication and you're not getting more benefit. You're not getting more effect. And so anyone who prescribes over that amount is misinformed either about the ceiling effects or, or the diversion risk. Uh, additionally, starting the medication is very important. There are no quantity limits on the two milligram uh, film or tablets, which is where we start with the uh, induction process or building up and starting the medication. Uh, the average processing time, again, is 30 minutes for prior authorization. It's almost immediate response. And uh, additionally, uh, removing the prior authorization could actually lose Vermont anywhere between 17 to $35 million. Uh, the reason being that there'd be increased use of uh, the formulation sublocate, which costs 10 to 15 times the amount of, of the buprenorphine and also loss in rebates that we get from the uh, companies that manufacture the suboxone and the, 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 the combination product. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll stop there and, and say thank you for the time and, and leave myself open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, and thank you for um, taking time out from your um, testimony to, uh, I mean, of your, of your doctoring uh, to provide us with testimony. Um, and it's really clear that you are, um, and I, um, that the way the hub and spoke program um, works, there is a very close tie to um, DIVA, and um, that's, that's helpful. Um, I have a question because I'm a social worker, I'm not a doctor. Um, who does the prior authorization? Do you call? Do you write something? Or is uh, um, does the physician do that? Does um, the person... <clears throat> at the front desk or is there a case manager who does the the what what is what what does it entail yeah, yeah. I, I do not personally do the prior authorization so that's probably so, a big so in your office who in your office who does it yeah so uh with the blueprint we have nurse case managers um okay that too or we even have receptionists who can do this uh usually we pre-populated the form with a lot of you know repetitive information and we fill in the specifics about that and it gets faxed off and we get the response from there. Okay, so um, this is, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very familiar as a social worker with pre-populated forms, but what are the questions and how many, is it one page? Um, 
And is it, what do I need to, what information do I need to have for the pre, to fill out this pre-authorization? Okay, so it is, it's, a, it's a one page form and it's gonna have the name of the patient and some other identifying information as well as the name of the physician who is uh, asking for the prior authorization. It's gonna ask uh, essentially about, wants to ascertain that this is being used for opiate use disorder and not some other purpose. And that you've had discussions with the patient uh, about uh, you know, side effects, appropriate use of the medication. And to then uh, write down the reasons why uh, this higher dose or this different formulation is clinically uh, indicated. So, um, thank you. If you don't fill it out, is the nurse case manager in the room? How does she know or he know the answers to why you think as the physician it needs to be different and what you have done? Sure. So how, how, does, how does that communication work? I, I will uh, give those specifics um, either in person or uh, <coughs> Electronic health records have, you know, texting fashion, uh, capability, uh, but also it's important I include that in my uh, progress note. So in case that needs to be sent along or definitely it's there for the, uh, uh, the nurse or the case manager to be able to find the appropriate, if the, the, the requested information to complete the form. So, so um, if I've come into your office and um, I have opioid use disorder and you've been treating me or whatever and... I'm going to need a higher than, I'm going to need a higher dosage or something. That's your assessment. Um, I live in suburbia. There are like seven pharmacies within five minutes of um, doctor's offices. Um, you tell me I've got one and I say, okay, I'm going to the pharmacy and I will be in the pharmacy within 15 minutes. Um, will the pharmacy even have yet the pre-authorization from you? Um, they would, uh, well, a couple of things here. Um, it often takes some time. Uh, I wouldn't go from my office in 15 minutes to get the pre-authorization. Of course, we're talking about somebody who's been on the medication for a while anyway. Um, but uh, typically we do hear something back. Again, the average is 30 minutes. Definitely by the next day, we'll have had a uh, decision, which is you know, most often an approval. And uh, additionally, if that has not been completed yet, uh, pharmacies have the opportunity to do an override, meaning to fill the prescription that I've uh, written for that higher dosage without having the prior authorization. So we have that cushion then while we, uh, in, in case we don't get the prior authorization right away, the patient is not left it's kind of sitting in the pharmacy waiting and waiting and waiting. They can actually get that higher dose. And I was, I was pleased. I did, I did a little informal research this weekend and talked to three pharmacists in the Burlington area. And I was pleased to know that they all were aware of, the pri of this three-day Medicaid emergency. One never would do it, no matter what. And they all said that the patient needed to know that there was this three-day, that they could ask that. So it was not something that the, that the pharmacy would offer when, you know, a, as a, did you know that, you know, didn't come in. But that's, all right. we did hear, it sounds like you um, um, may have talked with or reviewed our prior testimony from, um, Dr. Snow? No, what was his? Lord. Dr. Lord. Lord. Where did I get Snow? I'm sorry. Dr. Lord, who um, in, the, um, in those few occasions where you might need the mono um, dosage, he said, uh, now what was, basically it was moving mountains. It, it, took, it, it, it took, it, he said it would take an act of Congress to get pre-authorization. And, um, that's how he described it. And um, so I'm wondering if you, um, how you see the prior authorization of the mono um, as different from uh, that and, and, and how, how, to, how to make it less an act of Congress. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think too, I mean, there, there needs to be this kind of barrier to the mono product, uh, given all the, 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 the negative effects of it that I've mentioned there. Um, because most patients do not have serious reactions to the uh, combined product. Um, and there should be a process around this. I mean, the vast majority are done, are, are well suited to taking the films. If not the films, then you never go to the tablets. Uh, I mean, with any medication, of course, an extreme reaction is, is a possibility and it's relatively rare. So I just, I personally do not find myself advocating for the mono product, uh, except for in those cases where I actually have a documented medical reaction to it, which is really relatively rare. And in the case that I have that, there's never any issue getting the approval. It's, it's not an act of Congress if I have the, the right information in place. So thank you. So you disagree, this is helpful. Wait. You disagree with Dr. Lord. I appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. he might be more open to the mono product than I am and therefore has different experience with it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Dr. Kloster for being here. Um, I did just wanna start by um, making you aware in case if you weren't that um, as our draft sits today, we're looking for a report back to basically review current processes as they relate to prior authorization. I think that you provided a lot of clinical information to us today and we've heard a lot of different um, perspectives on what clinicians and doctors um, believe is the best path for their patients. But um, I did just wanna make you aware that um, we are um, looking for a report back. And I think that one of the things that I wanted to bring to your attention, some of the considerations that we're having as prior authorization, uh, not necessarily what the dose is or what's the medication is, but whether or not prior authorization is helping um, in this sense is that, you know, we received that, um, you know, of the 3000 prior authorizations plus that took place last year, 95% um, were approved and the 5% that were denied were basically because of uh, Medicaid being a secondary payer. Um, so the question is, is that if it's not, uh, if there's such a large amount of these prior authorizations happening um, and it's not necessarily changing somebody's uh, treatment, um, what is the purpose of this path, especially when looking at a lot of research that's been published related to Medicare um, that removing prior authorization um, increased uptake and treatment and decreased things like emergency room visits related to substance use disorder. Um, I think that there's a couple of uh, uh, articles in the Journal of American Medical Association that we saw that says that um, while health plans use prior authorization to encourage appropriate medication use and contain spending, it can also reduce the probability that a patient receives prescribed medications and lead to worse outcomes. Um, I also have uh, an article here, and I'm just wondering if these are the sorts of things that were taken into consideration is uh, the Journal of Managed Care and Specialty Pharmacy says that um, formulary coverage decisions may have unintended consequences on patient and payer outcomes despite lower drug utilization and pharmacy cost savings. Therefore, careful evaluation of restrictions before policy implementation and continued reevaluation after implementation is warranted. And so while I respect um, a lot of the clinical um, judgments that you're making and that we see that different clinicians have different perspective, different comfortability levels, I just wanna reiterate that what we're really looking at is, is prior authorization helping people in their treatment path or is it an additional barrier that may ultimately be um, discouraging people from receiving treatment and putting a lot of time onto providers for, for what cost other than, other than controlling costs between payers? Which may be important. Important. And, and so I, actually what I would like to ask as well is that um, one thing that I don't think you mentioned, Dr. Kloster, is that you mentioned to me prior is that you're on the clinical utilization review board. Um, and I'm wondering if these are some of the considerations that you've 
taken into account um, as you create recommendations. Yeah, you yeah, know, absolutely. And on the, the, the clinical utilization review board or curb as we refer to it, uh, the prioritization uh, process and the sort of you know, necessity or lack of necessity of it often comes up. Um, and again, as you were saying, you know, in many cases, you know, most physicians are responsible and you find that uh, if you're requiring prior authorizations and you're proving 100% of them, then really what is the point of doing those? Uh, I think in the case of a lot of, I don't know if any of the research is specific to prior authorizations around opiate use disorder, uh, typically, we're talking about broader ranges of medications and treatment choices in, in those regards. Uh, it, I think so it is for MAT. It is for MAT specifically. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, mean, yeah um, um, I was just going to say, um, I think what um, Representative Whitman is trying to, to um, perhaps ascertain is that um, we really appreciate, or he really appreciates, we all do, um, at your information. And, and as, you, as you are aware, we have heard um, some supporting this and some, some, and some physicians and provide medical providers having a different perspective. Um, and so we're back to the let's explore, let's be curious. And so setting up, and so, um, and that's, I think that's part of what he um, is getting at, that that's, we, we have heard, and we're not the body to um, decide for what is best medical practice, but we can ask um, the, the respective groups to be curious and to look at um, the multitude of experiences because, I mean, I will say for me, I was surprised to hear that um, several of the private insurers do not have this um, and, um, uh, it, as, as they testified to us. And um, so I'm going, okay, then if the issue, you know, what is the difference? What is the difference? And if the difference bottom line is the 17 to 35 million, then that's a different order of policy choice. So um, we're not asking anyone today to, to make that decision, but to help inform us as what will be the kinds of questions to ask in this report back. Gosh, okay. Yeah, but I think too, that I mean, one of my concerns is that there are a lot more providers in the uh, MOUD world these days and there are a great number of them who are not following clinical practices, the, the best practices. And, and for that reason, I think prior authorization might be useful to continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for that. We have a question from Representative Rosenquist. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kloster. Uh, I was a little confused as to what's the length of time, like a pre-authorization, is that good for just that one prescription or is it good for a period of time beyond that? Uh, yeah, I say those are typically good for at least one year. One year. So you just have to get free authorization once a year. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Thank you. I'll tell you, let, me, let me double check on that because for a lot of medications, uh, for the uh, continued use of the prescription, it's not required. But I do believe, though, for the uh, buprenorphine uh, prior authorizations, that we do wind up completing those once a year. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions then. I am very aware of your time and of the time of the two other medical professionals. Um, so we've got a question um, from, a question from um, Representative Small and then um, the final question um, from Representative Whitman. No, I'm good. Oh, you're good. I get the final question. Sorry, yeah. I'll do two then. Um, just, uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Cluster, for being here with us this morning. Uh, to build on Representative Rosenquist's question, if there was a change in dosage for uh, the patient, would that require a new prior authorization? Uh, if it's at 60 milligrams or lower, no. Uh, if it's above the uh, 16 milligrams, yes. 
And there's a, a difference if you're in a, a hub versus a spoke. If you're in a hub, at the, the threshold is 16 milligrams, and in the spoke, I believe it is 24. Or yeah. sorry, I've switched right. that. The, the other way around. Yeah, the other are way around. Are 24. Okay. Um, and I just really understanding that physicians are, are approaching this very differently and hearing your approach with the monobuprenorphine product, I, I would just like to know what, what that process would look like if you were to prescribe a monobuprenorphine. What steps would a patient have to go through in order to say, prove that uh, the monobuprenorphine product uh, was best for them? Yeah. Well, so first, of all, in, in worst case scenario, let's say what they were in the office for induction and had a serious reaction to it, you know, epinephrine, boom, end of story. We we go to the mono product. Uh, you know, then that relatively rare event. Uh, otherwise, it's typically hearing reports that you know I, I have I have a rash or you know I have swelling, in which case then we we have them come in the office and we witness and document these things and then sort of go to bat to get the mono product or you know, different product prescribed for them. Uh, but in a way, I mean, again, it's it's an unpalatable aspect of doing this work, but quite often it's a seeing is believing process. So just just to clarify, a, a patient would have to be prescribed the suboxone, and you would have to witness the the serious reaction uh, to then be able to prescribe a monobuprenorphine product. Right, that would be the process for someone who is say naive to uh, these medications. Otherwise, uh, you know, there might be a track record, in which case before we uh, start prescribing, we can gather information from the previous prescribers about what they've documented as far as uh, reactions to these products. And that sounds a, a lot like the med watch form. Is that, is that still the form that, that you would be using for that or is it just a, a similar process? Uh, no, it would just, uh, the med watch form was uh, Medicaid ceased requiring that in October of 2020. And uh, I'm talking about just sort of doing my diligence as I should always do. If somebody's transferring to a program or has left a program and is coming to me, I want to know what happened before. It's part of the history gathering so that we can uh, put together a plan that will uh, match their needs. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Foster, thank you so much. Um, I won't ask us all to get um, an MD degree after your testimony, but it's been really very, very helpful. And um, uh, um, it, it, hold on, um, Representative McFawn, I had said that the last question was from, um, as if you have a question, it's quick. I had said that we were finished. Uh, Madam Chair, I realize that I do not have a question. Um, what I would like to do from now on, when a doctor comes in here and tells us stuff that we don't try to convince that doctor of something else. And uh, the other thing is, Madam Chair, you have the right to ask as many questions as you want. And I respect that. But you took up a lot of time and you, you, you have done it on this bill. And, um, uh, and then to put a clamp on other people that want to ask questions, uh, I realize the other doctors are waiting, but um, let's, uh, let's be a little bit fair. Uh, most of these questions are being asked by the same people. So um, that's all you. I have to say. I do not have a question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative McFawn, and um, I appreciate your comments. Uh, I don't believe that there were other questions from the people who did not ask them today, um, but thank you. And again, thank you, um, Dr. Hosner. I appreciate the time. And um, I hope you don't mind my teasing you about us getting um, an MD degree. No, so that, I was hoping to do sort of, uh, you know, med school 101 here as well. So I appreciate that. I take that as a compliment. Yes, yes. <laughs> And I particularly like the fact that you um, provided us with what I would call the cliff notes that are on our, um, so that we can refer them. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Chairman Pugh, thank you as well. I appreciate the opportunity today. Thank you. Um, and committee, um, uh, um, Dr. Conjure, if you would please come and you get to sit in the witness um, seat right here. Welcome. 
welcome, welcome, thank you. And um, uh, uh, committee, um, I also believe that um, Dr. Conjure has uh, posted as, as, as a, some written remarks that are uh, on our webpage as well. But I wanna um, start by asking you to make your remarks um, and uh, then we'll probably ask you lots of questions. <laughs> Um, try to get our arms around this. Uh, so first, it's um, as you well know, there are basically two camps with respect to the prior authorization issue and the issue particularly of whether monobuprenorphine or buprenorphine with naloxone should be restricted. And I would only mention uh, in passing a reference to Dr. Kach uh, Judge Kach Katanji Jackson Brown, who talked about the fact that all of us have hidden biases. And I think that that's an important thing to understand. Even though we are professionals and we act professional, we often bring with us hidden biases about how people behave when they have an opiate use disorder. And in my experience, that is a very important consideration. My sole, my, my primary goal in treating people, as you're going to discover, I am not against prescribing monoview. But my, my primary goal in treating people is to keep them in treatment and to make sure they don't die. I've had one person die in the last seven years, uh, and I feel very badly about that. So I'm willing to accept the fact that I don't control behaviors outside of my office, which represents a very limited part of the time that a person is on this planet. And I'm willing to accept the fact that the way in which I recommend they take medications doesn't necessarily happen. So that's my bias. Uh, I've been practicing in Vermont for 45 years. And for the last seven years, I've been a wavered physician to uh, prescribe buprenorphine products. I have treated about 230 patients. 80% of them are still in treatment after an average of six years. And I think it's very important to understand that if somebody goes to a given practitioner and is not able to get the medication that person feels they need, they're gonna do what all of us do. They're gonna go somewhere else. And so my goal is to avoid that, to try and keep them in treatment with me. And that may mean that I have to change the kind of prescription that is not necessarily based on medical science, excuse me. I would refer, uh, before going, I'm not going to go into pharmacology. I'm going to refer to a physician by the name of Ivan Pavlov. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. Um, he did research several hundred years ago in, in Russia about behavior. And he, and he did it with dogs. Is this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes, the bottom line. So think about Pavlov when you think about the way people react to medication. Mm -hmm. If somebody thinks that the medication they're going to take will make them sick, that person is not going to take it. And it doesn't matter what the bioavailability is and what the pharmacodynamics are. And merely the fact of seeing that medication, and remember, you have to put it in your mouth and keep it there for five minutes. And if you think it's going to make you sick, it will. And so people, yeah, sorry, Ann. I apologize. I have to make a technical um, announcement um, because we are on YouTube and some people are having um, problems with the YouTube broadcast, they can hear us, but they can't see us. And if they would like to see us, if they um, go on their internet um, and go on the uh, legislative webpage to the Human Services Committee, um, doc is it documents? Um, under documents for today, Wednesday, under Julie Tucker's name is the link. Um, and uh, so you should be able to click there and get it. Um, and uh, so again, if you're having trouble seeing it, please go to our committee webpage um, and uh, un <clears throat> under Wednesday today, um, click on Julie Tucker's name and you will be able to get the video. I apologize, as, par as open meeting, we need to make sure that folks can see this. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. People interrupt me all the time. <laughs> so uh, I would mention, uh, so you have some perspective on my practice. 
about 45% of my patients have required a prior authorization for their treatment. I have never been denied. The process for me is a nuisance that serves no clinical purpose, but it's one that I'm accustomed to and I'm able to get through without much difficulty. I'm concerned solely about the stress that it places on the people I serve when the prior authorization doesn't come through as expeditiously as you asked about. And I'll address that more specifically with respect to the three types of prior authorizations. So maybe I should discuss that now. The first one is the dose limitation, which means that I am restricted to 16 milligrams. Dr. Klossler can prescribe 24 milligrams. The, all of us take, have the same training in the prescription of buprenorphine. And if I went to practice in a hub, I would be able to prescribe 24 milligrams. It makes no clinical sense to have this separation of powers. And 24 milligrams is an FDA approved dose. I think that the prior authorization should be lifted to 24 milligrams for all physicians, regardless. The DEA does a very good job of monitoring whether or not physician practices are appropriate. I don't think prior authorization prevents that. The problem I have is that it's, it's much easier to request a prior authorization in advance. And I always tell my patients, if you think you need to change the dose, call me, well, if patients all have my cell phone, and we'll talk about it and I can put in the prior authorization the day ahead of time. So that's planning and it's a mild nuisance and we can always, it's never denied. Because the reason I ask for it is because the current dose is not effective in maintaining them in treatment. And that to me is the key goal. About 28% of my patients are on monovib. All of those patients basically have been willing in the past to buy it on the street at a higher price because when they see or think about the buprenorphine naloxone product, it makes them sick. Many of them have documented reactions, but most of them have reactions that are conditioned behavior and they just refuse to take it. So what's gonna happen? I had one patient, for example, who uh, had not even asked me about a prior authorization and she kept trying to take the, the buprenorphine naloxone product. It made her sick and she continued to use opiates. And we had finally had a discussion. Well, it turned out she was swallowing it. Now, I think you may have heard from some of the testimony, if you swallow a sublingual tablet, you get no effect. But that was the only way she could avoid feeling sick when she had that thing in her mouth for five minutes. That's just a, one example of the kind of problem that occurs when you tell someone you can't have that product that someone else had. So I, generally speaking, will approve a request for monobuc in a person who is otherwise stable to treatment, accepting that it is more likely that those drugs are misused than buprenorphine, but both of them are misused. In fact, there are plenty of medications misused which do not require prior authorization. Uh, many of the opiates and opioids do not require prior authorization. Stimulants do not require prior authorization. And in fact, uh, fentanyl and heroin don't even require prescriptions. So the idea that you can prevent misuse by restricting the use of a prescription product to me is fallacious. The, the biggest issue with prior authorization is the one that can't be done in advance. And that is the person who needs the annual renewal. And the way that person, so a patient goes to the pharmacy, they have a prescription from me that's got several refills on it. They go to pick up their refill. The pharmacy then sends in the request to cover my meds to prior authorization. And it's denied because the prior authorization annual expiration date was yesterday. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. It may be a Sunday. So what is the patient gonna do? Now, if they belong to an ordinary practice, they're gonna have to call the practice to get a prior authorization submitted. They may or may not be able to get in touch with someone. They can always get in touch with me but I can't always get the prior authorization request in right away. So then the renewal has to be submitted, that same one page form, it is always approved. And when it's approved, it's approved quickly. But that's not the, that's not the crucial delay. The crucial delay is, and then the pharmacist has to resubmit the application to the pharmacy. So the chance that that's all gonna happen on the same day is low, unless the person has to come in, let's say at eight o'clock in the morning on a weekday. And that's never when it happens. If, if a drug has been approved for use, 
there's no clinical reason that it should be renewed every year. I think that is, if I could only get rid of one of the prior authorizations, that would be it, because all the others I can anticipate in advance and they're always approved. The process is not really very difficult. It's the one page form as Dr. Kloster indicated. I, I put down my reasons for requesting it and it's always approved. Uh, so when you're doing that in advance, it's not a big nuisance, but it, it's always approved. So it doesn't really change anything. It helps me establish a better clinical relationship with the patient. And the key, as I say, is that my patients have stayed in treatment for many years. Very few of them have wound up using opiates. The most common misuse for people who are being treated for overuse disorder are non-opiates, cocaine, methamphetamine, benzodiazepines, because even if they are using it in some other form, or even if they're sharing it or selling it, they're still using it, and that to me is the key. In fact, there was a study in Sweden that showed that 80% of people on buprenorphine shared their medications, but it wasn't only buprenorphine, it was penicillin. It was an anti-anxiety medicine, it was a stomach medicine. And I'm not gonna ask around the table, but everybody does this. We are all our own pharmacologists, and we are all our own doctors once we're out of the office. So the illusion that we are somehow controlling behavior by prior authorization is simply that. Uh, and that's the reason that I find it to be undesirable. As I say, if I can only do one thing, it would be get rid of the annual renewal. Because if at least then I can plan this in advance, I know how to do this. I know what I need to write down and uh, it's approved. It, Dr. Kloster is correct in being concerned that maybe people aren't following clinical guidelines, but that has nothing to do with prior approval. That's really a management issue for the Drug Enforcement Administration and maybe for medical review boards to look at doctor's practices or nurse practitioners, whoever's practicing. That's prior authorization does not address that. What they look at is a one page piece of paper. They don't know what I'm actually doing. They don't know if what I've said is true. So it just doesn't solve the problem. Uh, so I'll, leave, I'll leave my speech at that and then answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, ask um, Representative McFawn, do you have any questions? I can't hear you. Yes, Madam Chair, I do. I have one question. Um, thank you very much for that information, Doctor. Um, my question is this, how many of your patients, uh, what percentage of your patients um, use more than 16 milligrams? 27%. I'm sorry, sir. 27%. Thank you. Um, Representative Garfano and then Representative Rosenquist. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you treat any patients who are on private insurance. Pardon? I'm wondering if you treat any patients who are on private insurance and are not. Oh, yes. Paid. Yes. I mean, I work at the Community Health Center in Burlington. The overwhelming majority of my patients either have no insurance, in which case, ironically, they go to our pharmacy and they pay $30 a month for their buprenorphine monoproc, which is cheaper than the film or the combined product. But I do have some patients with private insurance. They're much easier. They don't, I don't, re, they don't usually, Medicare requires some prior authorizations. Their preferred drug is different from Medicaid, which is a big nuisance. Somebody switches from Medicaid to Medicare and all of a sudden, I don't know if you're familiar with all the names, when they were getting Suboxone, now they have to get a Subsol and they don't like it, it tastes different. People who've started on Subsol like it better because it tastes better, but they're not used to it. So you have to go through a few hoops to judge that. But with Blue Cross Blue Shield or uh, MVP, prior authorization is not usually required, regardless of the product. Thank you. <clears throat> and so if you pay cash, there's no prior authorization. That's correct. And I have, I, have some, I have some patients who initially said, I'd rather pay cash for my, for my monoview then wait for the prior authorization. I said, it shouldn't take that long, but if you want, I'll give you a prescription for a few days until we get it covered. Representative Rosenquist. Okay. Just I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Again, on the annual uh, reauthorization. So let's say we did away with that, okay? And uh, a patient comes to the pharmacist and lays down the prescription. How long is that prescription good for? In other words, it's 
is it renewed? They, the, there are restrictions on the amount of renewals you can do on uh, controlled substances, which vary by the substance, and I, I don't have any objection with those. For example, if you prescribe a full opiate, like oxycodone, you cannot have a prescription. If you prescribe, you may not, I'm sorry, you may not have a renewal. Okay. Those are not, or if you prescribe a stimulant, an amphetamine or a Vyvanse, any of those drugs, you cannot, you cannot have a renewal. With buprenorphine products, you can have up to three refills. You can have, uh, depending upon the dose, you can either get a two-week supply or a four-week supply. I wish that that were eliminated, but that's not the biggest issue. So I will, patients who are unstable may be getting, I have some people who in the beginning may be getting two or three days at a time, and I want to speak to them or see them. Uh, it may be a week or two weeks, but somebody who's doing very well will get a four-week prescription with two, with, uh, two refills, so a total of three months. So uh, that's the, lo the longest period of time that I would renew a prescription in a stable patient would be three months. Uh, if it's going to be, if they're limited to a two-week prescription, it's two months. Okay, so that would be the potential danger of getting rid of the annual uh, pre-authorization because somebody could continue to get the drug. No, the, 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 the limit on the, there's no prior authorization for how many refills a person is allowed, okay? Right. So the number of refills I put on the prescription is unaffected by prior authorization. I can put in up to three refills on any product. So that wouldn't be affected. And obviously, it doesn't come up for a, for a product that, well, it doesn't come for a product that doesn't require, it doesn't have refills on it. Uh, but that's just for the patient convenience. So I, have, I do have a clarifying question from Matt then. So when you um, do a prior auth, you get approval and you can keep doing refills under that prior auth for one year. And Correct. at the end of that year, you have to go through the process again. And what you were saying earlier then is that, unfortunately, when you have to wait until it's out before you can do the prior auth. It's well, you don't have to. As a matter of fact, I have, because of this issue, which is a big problem, and, and as, I, as I told you, I have a large number of patients who require prior authorization. I keep a separate database. And I put down when their prior authorization is due, and I check it. And I try and anticipate. If I know several days in advance, then I can do that, and it's not a problem. Okay. But that's my—I have to do that. Now, that's—I don't think I should have to do that. Um, I do it because it saves a lot of aggravation on the part of my patients, and it's no extra work for me. Because the prior authorization renewal just says, "Please renew the medicines." I don't have to put any justification. They say, "Okay." Oh, well, sorry. Could you just say that again? I so let's say, let's take the. If I have a medicine that requires prior authorization, let's say they're on 20 milligrams of buprenorphine, buprenorphine naloxone. When I submit the prior approval renewal, I just say request renewal of current prior authorization. And I don't have to put the reasons in again. They don't say, well, is it time to lower the dose? Do you want to change the product? They just approve it. And it takes, what, half an hour. But it has to get to them. That's the problem. And then it has to go from there to back to- And then the pharmacy, and then you know, there's this other step so I don't know if any of you have ever been to a pharmacy, but these days it's not a pleasant experience. And as someone said, you know, some pharmacists, you can do an override with it. Some say, no, I'm not going to do that. And some of them have a really unpleasant relationship. This is, you know, our patients uh, have a big problem with trust and pharmacies are not often the place where that is enhanced, shall we say. So once it's been approved, the pharmacy then has to resubmit the application and they have to be around when it comes back. Uh, if they have a line of people waiting to get things done. So that half hour window is almost meaningless in terms of the total delay in the process. I can totally relate. I've seen that happen in the pharmacy to someone who was young in front of me. Yeah, right? yeah. It's amazing how differently they're treated. Yeah. And of course, this is not restricted. The prior authorization problem is not restricted to uh, the, the opiate use disorder treatment medicine. But it's, it can be a nuisance for anyone who thinks that they have a legitimate refill and it turns out, oops. Yeah. But the, the pharmacist is for some obscure reason, let's say you are being treated with a, a prior authorization drug for rheumatoid arthritis, which is very expensive. The pharmacists are much more willing to give out a three day override on that than they are for people in our pain. It just mystifies me. 
Dr. Conger, thank you so much for being here today. I think what I've heard a lot through your testimony is, is the care for your patients and trying to make this a, a seamless process, even though it seems to be overly complicated in some areas. Um, looking at it in a, in a different light, I, I would love to know, I don't know if you prescribe opioids, um, but what the process is on Medicaid if we were in the opposite direction, if someone is experiencing pain, are there prior authorizations for opiates? Uh, not most of them. It depends upon the dose. For example, oxycodone, hydromorphone, dilaudid, even methadone does not require a prior authorization unless you get above, I'm not sure because I don't use it very much, but let's say, I know up to 40 milligrams does not require prior authorization. So a single prescription for a full opioid does not require prior authorization by and large. Now. Some of them may, fentanyl would be an exception to that. Some of that is related to cost, uh, but fentanyl is perhaps the one ex exception uh, that's usually, it's usually required that they've used some other opioid before that. <laughs> the irony is that in people who die of overdoses with fentanyl, they've all used some other opioid before that also. Uh, but generally speaking, no. Okay. Uh, Same thing is true for stimulants. You don't require prior authorization for that. Always concerning to hear that it's easier to prescribe the prescriptions that are, are causing these long-term issues uh, <laughs> rather than the treatment. There is a certain irony to that. I should also mention, uh, in order to prescribe buprenorphine, a provider has to take a course. It's a very good course. In order to prescribe a full opiate, the prescriber doesn't have to do that. You don't have to have any special training to prescribe the drugs for which we need to provide the treatment with buprenorphine. And that's, that was the big problem that occurred uh, uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you want to know more details on that, you should read my book. <laughs> <laughs> Which is available at Bear Pond. I think. <laughs> Thank you. Could you just review again? You said there were three types of prior authorization. One of them being the annual renewal. Right. Okay. And what were the other two? The other two are a dose between 16 and 24 milligrams and the prescription of monobut as opposed to buprenorphine naloxone, which you heard quite a bit of testimony. About. I find it, I don't find that to be clinically useful. It's the one that, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a nuisance. It doesn't bother me much because I know what I need to write and I only, I only do that when I think it's a good idea and it's always approved. And that's always ahead of time. So. That one is not, although it is the one that is, produces the most anxiety among patients, it's the easiest one to forestall, I should say. Because of donated advance. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's not, it's, really, it, it's not an act of Congress. I mean, it takes me, what, five minutes? I have, my, I have my letter already written. Just put the name on it. Thank you. Uh, doctor, we have. Um... We have um, been persuaded, or we have come to, um, in terms of where we are in, in, in our part of this discussion, to realize that um, we are not at a place where um, working with the administration um, or also weighing, I mean, you were here, weighing the, the, the different, as you said, the different camps or the different perspectives on this. So we are um, going to be um, asking for information or a report back. So what would be the questions that you think we should be, that, that, that would help, help us chart a path forward? Okay, so let's take the three categories. The first one, which I think in many respects is the easiest, is why should a practitioner have a different restriction on the dose of buprenorphine based on where that person is practicing rather than a person's experience? Now. Uh, the feds, for example, limit the number of patients you can treat based on your number of years of experience, but they don't have any limit on the dose. So I would ask, why am I restricted to 16 milligrams and Dr. Klosser can do 24? So that addresses the first issue. The third one, uh, the, the second issue is why an annual renewal is needed for a chronic medication. Um, the same could be true if somebody's taking a very expensive medicine for diabetes. Why do they have to renew it annually? It's a chronic treatment of a chronic disease or hypertension. There are medicines that are very expensive and require prior approval. The annual renewal of a chronic medicine that is not expected to change doesn't make any sense to me. So you say, why, why is that necessary? 
And then the third one is the prior authorization for buprenorphine naloxone, which is the most controversial. You've heard my bias on it. You've heard Dr. Kloster's bias on it. If I had to pick one thing to change, it would be the end renewal. And the second one would be the 16 to 24. That's going to cover a lot of ground. And I'm willing to go through, jump through the hoops. But the problem is it's pointless because it always gets approved. I mean, even now, I think 81% in the last year of the prior authorizations for buprenorphine naloxone were approved in that legislative report. So it's, it always gets approved. So it seems to me it's creating an unnecessary bureaucracy that doesn't really solve any purpose. And I would say, if most of them are approved, what's the point? Rosenquist, I just thank you. To better understand the third one you talked about, which you claim is the most troublesome one, apparently. And that's when somebody is moving from the naloxone to the, the butte, right? Or, right, okay. correct. Uh, is, is that correct? And That's correct. The combination medicine, they're getting off that and going to the butte. Correct. Uh, anytime that happens, they need a prior authorization. That's correct. Even if there was a prior authorization, I mean, a annual authorization. Uh, well, if they were, uh, if they had a prior if they had a prior authorization for some you know let's say for 18 milligrams then it would be a new prior authorization to change the product if they had a prior authorization sometimes what happens is uh, a person uh, get, is on uh, buprenorphine in fact in, in prison everybody gets subutex it's mono yeah mono sorry Sub, uh, buprenorphine products it's cheaper for the prisons it, it dissolves more rapidly, and if, I won't go into the details of how easy it is to misuse things in prison, but that's what they prescribe. So I have patients who were uh, on Suboxone, who were incarcerated, they were switched to uh, Monoview, and they get out, and they're given a uh, one-day prescription sometimes, uh, and now they come to me, and they want to get back their medication. The fact that they were getting it in prison didn't require prior authorization, so I have to submit that. Uh, or they may have taken it in the past, but if they have, if it's if the prior authorization has expired, if it's more than a year, then it has to be renewed regardless. It just has to be done. Thank you. You might bring someone in from the, the Department of Corrections and ask them how they made that decision about Monoview and what their concerns were. Thank you. Um, I wanna, I'm looking around the table and um, on video on the screen, does anyone have any uh, further questions uh, for Dr. Conjur? If everyone's done with their questions, I just have a final comment. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm checking and making sure. Um, I see no more questions. Rep uh, I'm just making a statement. Real okay. Um, and I'm not opposed. I, I'm, I'm all very open to considering things. But if 81% of prior authorizations are approved, that is the majority, but that still means one in five is not approved. Correct. And I'd like to, you know, know, what, know why. Because uh, uh, I don't have that information. I know you don't. But, I can, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, I would guess, I mean, occasionally, a, uh, I've noticed, you know, who, who makes a decision about the prior authorization? It's basically that person being a judge. It may affect what that person had for breakfast. I don't know, their mood. I've noticed that sometimes my initial request will be denied mm -hmm. and I submit further information and it's approved. So it would be, if you really want to know about that 19%, you would want to know how many were ultimately approved, or some of them simply denied and then reapplied. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that those people who submitted requests didn't bother to put in the documentation necessary, which is what I would suspect. It's, you know, if, if, you're, if your view is that it's a nuisance and you're a provider, unfortunately, you may just not care. Oh, yeah. And if you don't care, you say, okay, I'll submit the prior authorization, but I don't really care if it gets approved or not. And so they just don't put enough reasons in. I mean, the reason I usually put in is that this person's at risk for stopping treatment or for resuming opioids. And mm -hmm. invariably that's approved. They don't want that to happen. We don't, none of us want it to happen, including the patient. Um, thank you. And we have um, 
Doctor, we have a, a, another comment. <laughs> and, this yeah. not, and this is not about all this, truly. I just wanted, first of all, to thank you for how, how you have your own system so you can know the prior approval ahead of time. I mean, there's just so many things that you said today that was a learning experience for me, as well as just a caring experience. But I also wanted to say that I love how you started explaining about your bias and I always, my husband is a physician and he always starts every speech with his bias. And I say, why? Why do you do that? No one cares. <laughs> and now I say, well, because you explained it perfectly and in an example that made a lot of sense. And I can see now why physicians often do that. And then the other part was the path flow. Um, that's another um, thing that he quotes all the time. <laughs> and then finally, your tie. I love that you wear tie. Oh, this is the same. The, this is the same. The children tie. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, you know, it's just perfect for the building. And I, um, I oh, yeah, there's so many things. <laughs> that me, so I just have to say thank you for being. This here. is the first time I've worn a tie in three years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mac told me I had to wear a tie. So, <laughs> always do what she says. Well, tell her we noticed. Yes. <laughs> And it's still be on video on YouTube, right? Yeah. <laughs> Although, unfortunately, I don't know how much they see you. Yeah, I, I know. Oh, no. yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. 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 okay, okay, good. If she, if she submits a request to someone, oh, document. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, now I spent two years at the CDC, which influenced substantially my recognition of the issue of selection bias and all kinds of biases. Does your husband have any epidemiological training? He has some, but he's also in an administrative role. Ah, okay. so I think that's partly yeah. why. Yeah. Yeah. It is unfortunate that most of us who purport to be scientists don't recognize that issue. But I'll, <laughs> that's the subject for another year. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so okay, much. My pleasure. I really appreciate You guys are doing good work. <laughs> Um, and now we have um, uh, Jacqueline Bray, who is a nurse practitioner from Safe Recovery. Um, Jackie, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me this morning. I'm a nurse practitioner uh, currently working as a buprenorphine prescriber um, within Howard Center. So I work at the low barrier buprenorphine program in Burlington it's called Safe Recovery. And then I also practice and see patients out of an office in St. Albans serving the Grand Island Franklin County communities. Um, and also coming here with a little experience um, working as a nurse prior to attending NC school at the Chinden Clinic in Burlington. Um, and so, so I, I am going to be referencing some notes, reading, um, reading some things. Just I apologize for looking back and forth. Um, but basically, you know, in my experience, the prior authorization process required um, is creating some unnecessary roadblocks that prevent patients from receiving the care that they deserve. And I have been finding myself tailoring my prescribing practices to what my patients can access the easiest and quickest. And this often doesn't align with what is a best practice or the best plan or even what is evidence-based. Um, and so the first part I wanted to speak to was um, in regards to the PAs required for um, prescribing doses greater than 16 milligrams. And this, you know, kind of the thought of what an optimal or adequate dose of Suboxone is for someone is first based on some older data um, that are that were kind of created based on studies of looking at people who were um, mainly using heroin um, and this idea that the opiate receptors are mostly blocked at 16 milligrams and anything above that is not having an effect is a little outdated. Um, for example, you know, one of the guidelines that's out there is if you have a patient coming in reporting that they're using about 10 bags of heroin a day, an optimal dose that's recommended for them would be the 60 milligrams. However, unfortunately, um, right now, most patients are not using just heroin. Um, it's, the drug supply is contaminated with fentanyl, 
which is much more potent and stronger than heroin. And so um, it makes sense that potentially we're seeing people who need um, increased doses of the Suboxone. And in general, the response to um, treatment varies widely among patients, just like with any medication, you have different um, responses based on somebody's metabolism and other lifestyle factors. And so we should really be titrating someone's dose based on the clinical response um, and the restrictions that the TA places uh, may impede providers' ability to, to do this. Um, and furthermore, one of the most important pieces is, is the barrier that this creates for the patients. And so uh, much of the population that I serve um, are homeless. They have limited or no access to transportation. And so typically they rely on one ride um, to bring them to the office to the visit. And that same ride takes them to the pharmacy directly after their appointment to pick up the medication. So often patients are telling me they don't have time to wait for the paperwork to be approved. If it's, you know, even if it's a half an hour, that's a half an hour that their ride isn't willing to wait. So they may make the decision to delay increasing the dose until the next visit. And if this is the case, um, it increases the risk that they may use illicit substances because their dose is inadequate and subsequently be at higher risk for overdose. Um, in regards to the MedWatch form, um, again, medication adherence is, is vital to a person's success in a, in a MAT treatment program that the medication is not going to work if a patient is not going to take it. Um, and, you know, yes, there are, the risk of diversion is out there, but as, um, you know, I think we've heard that is something that we can't necessarily always control. And, um, one of the reasons that the street value is so high for buprenorphine is because it is not as available or readily accessible. Um, and unfortunately, there are some adverse effects that patients experience from the combo product um, beyond sort of what would be acceptable for another medication as a side effect. Um, and that makes the medication intolerable and patients ultimately don't adhere to the medication regimen. Um, so for all, I won't say all, but for most other meds, um, you will be able to go into your provider's office and say, Look, I've been taking this uh, formulation. It's making me really nauseous. It's not going away. I've tried other um, remedies and supportive care, and the nausea is just not worth it to me. I'm not going to take the medication. And as a provider, we would able, be able to document that in the clinical record and switch to a formulation. Um, that's not the case with the monobup. Um, first, most of the time, um, patients have to demonstrate pretty much a life-threatening severe reaction to the medication, um, and which requires them to come into the office um, and take a medication that we know they may have an adver adverse reaction to. Um, and so it's just not something that I think is, you know, necessarily humane to ask a patient to continue taking a medication that they, they need, um, but puts them at, at other health risks. Um, I've had patients drop out of treatment because they have found that they can um, more easily access the mono product off of the street. And that is, again, easier and more rapid than waiting for um, waiting to go through that whole med watch process. Um, additionally, when coming into treatment, which is, you know, when a time that most people are, are at, you know, one of their most vulnerable states. Um, and I, yeah, anecdotally, again, as Dr. Conger said, not a lot of this is always based on science and the data, but anecdotally, most patients um, find that the transition from illicit substances to a maintenance therapy is a little bit easier with the mono product. Um, and so whether that's a placebo effect or not, it's something that they're more willing to do. And so I, you know, uh, the Safe Recovery Program is embedded in a syringe service program. So I often see patients who are regularly accessing the syringe exchange. They want to start treatment, but have shared that they um, 
are a little ambivalent or would be more ready to engage if they could more easily start with a monoproduct. Um, the fear of precipitated withdrawal with the suboxone is a deterrent. And again, whether that is perceived by the patients or actually real, I think it's, you know, perspective here is what matters. Um, <clears throat> and just, you know, in another piece uh, kind of to bounce off of Dr. Conger is that the fact that people are prescribed a mono product in, while they're incarcerated. Um, we also know that when they're released from incarceration, that is a very high risk time for someone to return to use. Um, and because of that absence from use, they're at much higher risk for overdose. And so by in transitioning to a medication, a different medication can be destabilizing. Um, and so the fact that they're required to do that, again, just adds to that risk. Um, and so in closing, I just, you know, some may argue that the PAs are approved quickly and um, within a few hours. However, from my experience, the patients that I serve are really in survival mode. They're living their lives minute to minute, sometimes, you know, just to stay alive. Um, and a minute to approve paperwork is too long for some to wait and exponentially increases their chance of either not engaging in treatment to begin with dropping out of a treatment program or resorting to more rapidly accessible street substances, um, which ultimately increases um, their risk for overdose and death. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the job that you do. Um, the three of you who are testified today are I think really um, uh, practicing in a very um, difficult uh, and challenging area, especially now. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, um, question, yes. Um, Jackie, thank you for being here this morning. Um, I just want to ask you the same question that we finished with Dr. Conger on. And if, if you were looking at... Um, uh, being in, in our role, what, what would be the questions that we would need additional answers for um, as we look to the Drug Utilization Board to uh, assist us with further information? It's going to um, improve I, outcomes for people. Yeah, I think um, this may be kind of a, <laughs> one of the more challenging questions to, to answer, but I think if you know, overall looking at what is driving the utility of the prior authorization process and how how much of um, our stigma and bias in regards to looking at behaviors and engagement and response and treatment for those who individuals who um, misuse substances is playing a role here. Um, because again, you know, like I said, any other, any other medication, this process isn't there. And I think, um, the prescribe, but it's also not to say that prescribers can't continue to have clinical discretion in limiting, uh, limiting doses or having other, um, preventative ways to create diversion or to prevent diversion. So how is this prior authorization process really, um, what is the what is the underlying purpose of it that we can't achieve in other ways in the in the clinical setting? Thank you. I am looking around the room, and um, I am looking on screen uh, for Representative Rosenquist. Yes, <clears throat> on the. The primary reason would appear going from the combo drugs to the acute treatment, it would seem that uh, the trying to control cost is the primary reason that that exists, it would appear like to me. And yet we've heard from others that the majority of those are ultimately approved. Uh, anyway, would, would, it, would there be an increase in the movement to the butte product you think if there was a prior authorization? Uh, I, I don't 
don't actually, um, just because I think it, you know, from the DEA perspective and, and regulatory boards, you know, buprenorphine is still seen as more easily divertible. And um, for that reason, I think as a prescriber, I would, you know, still do my due diligence to make sure that I'm prescribing the medication because that's the one that's you know, really indicated in the one that the person is going to adhere to taking um, and would still be cautious, would still have those um, kind of that baseline of, you know, that's not, that's not going to be the one that I start with necessarily. I think the rule of thumb and, and the general practice guidelines are that Suboxone is the preferred medication and that um, it would be independent practitioner making sure that they're doing their due diligence to make sure that um, if they are prescribing the monoproduct that it is for the um, correct reason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I'm again going to represent Whitman. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Jackie, for being here today and for all the work that you do. Um, I just wanted to follow up on one comment that you made, um, and that's that you said that you have had patients that have dropped out of treatment um, due to some of the barriers and that it may be more easily accessible um, on the street. And we haven't had the opportunity to hear directly from uh, people who have engaged in treatment. I was wondering if you could just provide um, some of the perspectives that you believe, uh, you know, that have led you to believe this, some of the things that you've heard from patients. Yeah, of course. So there, um, you know, I, I think there, uh, as someone who prescribes this medication, the pharmacology of kind of the naloxone component and component and the absorption can be confusing. And so I think that um, exists in the in the community as well. And so again, whether uh, there are a lot of patients who have that perception that um, starting on the mono product or buprenorphine is going to make the transition a little bit easier. Because there's this thought that because the suboxone has naloxone in it, it will cause them to have precipitated withdrawal. Um, again, this is not thought to be the case as naloxone isn't always absorbed systemically, but there are, again, I think some people who may absorb more of it um, than others and are at higher risk for that precipitated withdrawal. And we know in the hub setting that when someone is transitioning from methadone to suboxone, they do a bridge of buprenorphine. Um, so basically, um, somebody has to titrate down their methadone, and then they go a few days without any medication. Then they start the mono product, and then they switch to Suboxone. So, um, and I have patients who have that experience as well. And with the um, pregnant people, it used to be recommended that people who were pregnant were automatically switched to the buprenorphine. And so there is because of those practices that we have that have been out there and we still are continuing, there remains this idea in the community that the buprenorphine is the more favorable product in terms of um, side effects and transitioning to maintenance therapy as being like a smoother process. And so when patients are coming, thinking about coming into treatment or are in treatment and have um, had an episode where they return to use and are looking get, to get back on medication. If they're not um, able to easily access the mono product, they have said, well, I'm going to do this on my own on the street with the buprenorphine, and then maybe I'll come back to you for treatment. But I'm not going to do the med watch form and wait for all the paperwork to go through. Um, you, most often when people present for treatment, they're ready to start that day. And we need to be able to um, uh, optimize that moment and meet them where they're at. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, I want to uh, do a check around the room and uh, on the screen, are there any final comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie, for taking your time and um, 
again um, for adding your voice and your your express what your experience to our discussion as we try to figure out what policies to do. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me and hearing my hearing my perspective and thank you for all the work that you do. Um, uh, we're going to take take a pause, um, a break until 1045. And when we come back at 1045, um, we will be talking about um, what we've heard in terms of the uh, um, amendment that uh, Dane is, is proposing um, related to getting information. Um, so to reiterate, we've taken um, well, the Appropriations Committee, um, and and we agreed have have withdrawn. You know the um, the first four the first four parts of the those parts of the original bill that related to doing away with preauthorization, and instead we are going towards going to a getting a more information perspective. And so we're going to talk about that. And um, I understand that. Uh, Someone from Diva will be able to join us maybe at 11. Um, they, they've gotten copies of any sort of random thoughts we've had in writing um, so that they know where we're going. <laughs> 